All right, folks, it's another week, which means it's another what the F happened. Welcome to all of you signing in from YouTube, Facebook. We got TikTok back online. We got Instagram back online. And we've got none other than the Lazy Cash in the house, along with Mr. Snaggy. So today on What the F, there's been no shortage of wacky news. I mean, it's almost like the Twilight Zone every time I look at the news channels. I mean, if it's not ships hitting bridges. I mean, we just had a barge hit another bridge in Arkansas. You probably haven't heard about that one yet. Then all of a sudden, you know, things going on with the Fed and are they going to drop rates? Are they not? The markets have been hemorrhaging. Crypto and Bitcoin has been losing like 5% in a day in a 24 hour period. So lots to talk about, a lot to unpack, including real estate. So that's what Stephen, myself and Mr. Lazy Cash are going to do for you in just a second. We'll be right back after this. You know, we were talking about the twilight zone, you know, and how the news and the economy feels like the twilight zone. Stephen, how about that music for a theme about the twilight zone? It almost kind of sounds like twilight zone. But to the, folks, thanks so much for joining us. This is like our first episode we've been able to do in like three weeks where Stephen, myself and Mr. Lazy Cash are in the house for What the F Happened. The show where we rant, we rave, and we will argue if we must. But we are going to get into this. Stephen, where should we start on today's show? I mean, <laughs> there's so many different places we could start right now. But I just wanted to wish everybody, um, hope everyone this weekend had a wonderful day on Sunday. It was officially um, the Trans Day of Visibility on Sunday. So hopefully everybody celebrated. And, oh, wait, wait a minute. That's according to uh, Joe Biden and the White House administration. It was Easter for the rest of America. So hopefully everybody has celebrated Easter and had a great time this weekend with their family. Uh, just joking a little bit, having some fun to kick off the show. But it just goes to show you some of the craziness going on in the country right now and, and, and what's happening. And as we get closer to this election, it's going to get crazier and crazier. So it just reminds us that we need to kind of learn, remember to you know, get rid of all the, the noise. You know, a lot of the stuff that's talked about on the news, the talking heads, the Biden administration, the Republicans, Trump, all of it at the end of the day is noise. How does it really affect our lives, our finances, our money, our families? And to me, that's the important part. So what I'm going to do today, Chris, is maybe we can break through some of that noise. It's just been constant, constant, constant. And let's talk a little bit about what is going on with the economy, what is going on with the markets, what's going on with real estate, and how can we take advantage of this stuff to make sure we're set up here in 2024? I like that. I got someone, uh, Marcus, saying that I'm echoing. Is that better if I mute when Steven's talking? Brand new uh, kind of temporary setup here at the new offices. So this is... This is my new office. We set it up just so we had a place where we could do shows so I don't have to go back to the other studios. Our new studios, which are being built out back from this office, are almost done. But uh, is that better? You guys still hearing an echo? Stephen, on your end, how's it sound? It sounds fine to me. Um, I did get a text that said it sounded a little bad, though. Yeah, I mean, it's a brand new setup, so we got some bugs to work out. But I'll just mute when Stephen's talking. So... It, it is the twilight zone. It, it's kind of a, a strange dynamic of all the stuff going on. And I had heard about that on Easter Sunday because that's what most of us celebrated. And, you know, I got a three and a half year old. So we were out uh, hunting down Easter eggs, visiting with family and really celebrating, you know, the resurrection when I guess, uh, you know, Joe Biden had other plans. It was uh, pretty interesting uh, that that had to fall on Easter Sunday, which is kind of, if, I'm not saying for everybody, but kind of a sacred day. Uh, wouldn't you agree, Stephen? Yeah, yes, I would definitely agree. Absolutely. All right. But we don't really need to go into that. So let's let's get into other news. So I don't know how many of you have been following the markets the last few days, but they have not been good. The markets have been hemorrhaging. So we we're off for the third day now. We had a couple hundred. I, I thought yesterday was going to finish like 500 points down. 
but we ended up finishing, I think, around just under 400 points down. Today, in the futures, we are off to a pretty rocky start uh, where everything's down, but oil's up. That's right. And, and a lot of people probably don't understand this or don't care about this, but why? Why are the markets going down? You know, everybody just thinks the markets can only go up these days, but they're going down. And a lot of that is because the Fed just doesn't know what direction to go. So, Stephen, this is, I think, a, a topic we can really, really hit on is the Fed. Jerome Powell and the, the band of whatever you want to call them, merry men and women, and I think Satan sits on the board, but that's just my opinion. I think uh, they're very confused. I mean, the economic reports are coming out and they got all the, the access to the economists and the data, but which way is the economy going to go? Are we going to lose jobs? Are we going to gain jobs? And are the jobs reports even something to look at because the jobs reports keep getting revised. And then when you really look at that, is it, you know, are they just guessing? I think a lot of the jobs report numbers really has to do with lagging information. So they, they post jobless, you know, reports or job numbers, and then they, they're updated almost always because they get that data in after the fact. But because of that, you've got problems where inflation is down around, I can't remember where it is now, I've lost track, but in the 3% range. And because it's in the 3% range, we are now almost going back up. And there's a lot of talk about the Fed dropping rates, which is exactly what Wall Street wants. So when Wall Street, the whiny little baby, doesn't get what they want, the markets go down. So now there are people saying that the Fed, you know, who had said they might drop rates three times, but the markets built in six rate decreases. So I don't know, Stephen, I guess people do math differently over there in the Fed than we do here in Buffalo, New York, because if somebody says we're going to drop rates three times, how many times are they going to drop rates, Stephen? I would think three. Yeah, not six, right? No. Yeah, so I don't know where the market's built in six, but now you got some people coming out saying they're thinking that they're only going to drop rates one time. I just saw an article that came in where somebody was saying they're they're counting on the Fed dropping rates one time, which will not be good for the markets. Treasury yields have gone up, which means the price of treasuries have gone down again, making a very unique buying opportunity. But anyway, you know, like this is just a an interesting year, but listen, I want everybody to think about the past because in the past, if you follow any other election year, it's a very similar kind of story. The markets are usually up in an election year. And after the election happens, usually the markets go down. I guess uh, we uh, all know what's coming, but are we actually paying attention? Stephen, what's your take on that? Yeah, yeah I mean, the stock market's always been mind boggling to me over the last several years. It's, 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 um, you know, technical analysis and fundamentals seem to be just thrown out the window. The the multiples on how they value these companies right now and and where they're at is just uh, it's unrealistic. It's unsustainable. And so, you know, it, many people believe it's a bubble and it's it's going to pop and come down. Um, you know, when that happens, you can't time the markets. I mean, that's always going to be true. So you just have to look at your overall picture and think to yourself, if the markets do pull back 20%, 30%, 40%, even 10%, you know, are you okay with that? Can you outlast that for it to come back? I mean, you know, it could take a decade to come back. It could come back in a year. Um, nobody knows. So you just got to kind of be prepared. And to me, the juice is not worth the squeeze right now. The risk is not worth the reward. So for me, I think there's much better places to deploy capital and, and money right now and some alternative investments. I mean, you mentioned oil before. Um, you know, something we look at, you know, obviously we do a lot with real estate and especially real estate um, transactions that are shorter term that, you know, even if markets change, uh, we'll still be successful, multiple exit strategies, multiple, you know, ways to profit on these deals. And it's all about education though. You know, do you understand and like what you're investing in? You know, is it something that maybe you need to invest in yourself first to allow yourself to get that education and understand it? So there's always different factors factors that go into it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the markets are wild. What I'm really, I mean, I'm 99% sure the markets are going to have a pretty hefty pullback and retraction, if not crash in the next, I don't know, year or two. Right. But what I'm really curious to watch happen is what's going to go on with cryptocurrencies and specifically Bitcoin. Um, you know, I, I had a talk with, a, I did a podcast with a young guy yesterday. His name's Robert Lee. 
and um, really cool. But he does a lot with crypto and kind of talking about Bitcoin and 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 his beliefs on it. And it's it's definitely interesting. You know, I've never been a huge fan of cryptos and Bitcoin just because I don't think I understand them, and, and I've never really dug that deep in. And I just I don't see what they're based on. I don't see their value. You know, other than what people think it's worth. And to me, that's just not a great investment. But it's you know I've been proven wrong time and time again. It just hit seventy thousand dollars a coin which is wild you know it's pulled back to i'm looking right now sixty five thousand seven hundred. but we were in the 20,000s not six months ago i think i mean i have to go back and look but it wasn't long ago we were at 20 so it's, it's quadrupled since then almost which is wild and so it's just these roller coasters the volatility and i always go back to the fundamentals of wealth creation which is reduced risk reduce risk, encourage reward, be conservative when things are unknown and, and, and just keep that strategy. But everyone's different at the end of the day, Chris. So I just want to kind of talk a little bit more about rates. We had somebody come in from TikTok asking, where do you expect rates to be this summer? I, I would say rates will be right where they're at now. I don't think you'll see much. I think rates are going to remain higher for longer, as the Fed said. I think the market got a little bit ambitious that the Fed was going to drop rates because their inflation was close to their 2% target. But again, close doesn't mean you're there. So if you're close to the finish line, but you stop right before you cross the finish line, do you win the race? No, you're close, but no one's going to sit there and be like, wow, you ran a great race. Good job. You finished second place. Nope. You didn't cross the finish line. So the Fed isn't at their target. So therefore the Fed is being very cautious because the Fed knows. If they drop rates too soon, they're going to they're going to drive inflation back up, especially in real estate. I've got a bunch of white papers that I'm going to go into about real estate. So so for that person that asked, where do I see rates in the summer? Exactly where they're at now. I don't see a rate cut before summertime. I do not. I bet you, you probably won't see a rate cut until third quarter would be a safe bet. So if anyone was expecting rate cuts for refinances, for real estate or just to help their portfolio go up, I, I just don't see that. I think now is still a great time to take gains off the table, whether it's crypto gains. And, and again, I'm right where you're at, Stephen, with crypto. I don't really I don't really have a dog in the fight on crypto. I mean, I've got money in it, but all I do, and we were just doing um, year-end 1099s and taxes. You know, all I did last year, I made money in crypto. I did really well in crypto, but you know how I did it? I buy it every single week. And I, when it gets to these high things, which you just turn the news on, it's like, oh, crypto's at an all time high. I'm like, I go into Coinbase, I hit sell and then I get paid. And then I just keep repeating that cycle. And, and I've made money doing that. I'm not saying that's going to be right for everybody, but that's just how I'm playing the game. I'd rather have money in treasury bonds and treasury bills than I would crypto right now. It's too volatile. And like you said, the juice isn't worth the squeeze for me. Um, so Jim came in from YouTube and said, I disagree with Chris on rates. The Fed has or the Fed has to reduce or the Treasury can't pay interest on our debt. So I'll rebuttal that, Jim, or debate that. So you're wrong about the Treasury, uh, you know, well, it wouldn't be the Treasury paying, it'd be the government paying the interest on the debt. So they definitely can because they can just keep printing more money to do that. And if you haven't been paying attention to the, the deficit, the U.S. deficit, they're certainly printing more money, driving up more debt. So the Fed isn't going or the government, the U.S. is not going to default on their bonds. They're just going to go to the, the Fed, which basically controls the Treasury, and they're just going to print more money to make their payments. But I do agree that's a pressing issue. But I think that's taking a back seat to all this political jargon and nonsense going on uh, with the election year. So I don't think that's so much of an issue. And I don't think the Fed's going to drop rates too soon and jeopardize driving inflation back up. Stephen, anything on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the debt conversation is definitely fascinating. I mean, just to kind of show you in a chart form what this looks like, um, you know, this is an economist on, on X, but, you know, how do you go bankrupt gradually and then suddenly is, is the comment. But you know, we look at the, the black line being U.S. Treasury interest payments, um, projection of uh, assume stable uh, rate stable and projection assuming 150 basis point Fed cut. So what does that look like? And you know, either way, we're seeing this just incredible U.S. interest payments just since 2020, just skyrocketing. And, you know, this this, this interest is, you know, in, in many scenarios, unsustainable. So just to show you the numbers, the rate of increase is up roughly 15 times. Um, so Q3 of 91, which was what, 01, 21, 23 years ago, uh, 304 billion Q3 of 2021. So 20 years later. 508 billion and look at this just not even two years later 
almost a trillion dollars. And I think Q4 did hit a trillion dollars. And so you see this massive increase in, in debt obligations uh, or in interest that we're paying on these debt obligations. So it's three decades in under two years, a new $320 billion of recurring obligations added to just seven quarters. And this is all directly from um, the federal government uh, Fed you know, charts. So is that sustainable? I mean, I think that's the question at this point. I really don't know. Uh, that that's a good question, and I mean that'd be a question for anyone you know that's that's typing in here from YouTube or TikTok, and uh, you know, like I don't think it's sustainable. But again, you know, if you try to fight the Fed, then you're always going to lose because the Fed holds the key to the printing press, and they control monetary policy. So there could they could always just print more money, weaken the dollar. I mean, this happened in Germany. I mean, let's not forget about what happened in Germany. I mean, that's exactly what their government did. Because of the war, they kept printing and printing and printing. And after the war, they, they didn't win the war. They're, they're, they, you know, the, well, I keep wanting to say the euro, but the German, was it the German franc, I believe it was, dropped. And also, folks, that post that just came in from Facebook about Chris Nago giving 40 BTC bonuses, obviously, that's not me. Those are scams. I hate to even have to bring that up. We'll delete it, but I hate to even have to bring this up that when you see that, that isn't me. That's a scam. It's an old scam. And, and Stephen, just, just get rid of that one. So I want to go back to this, and then we're going to move on to a new topic. Uh, maybe we'll talk hey, and about real it. Chris, so, yeah. just one more thing real quick on that, um, on the, 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 you know, the war or, or just about the debt and the war part. I mean, it, it does affect the, the country, you know, as a whole, because, you know, here's another pretty smart post, but, you know, it, it, future defense spending is here, uh, exported on the assumption that it remains consistent. 40 per 48 percent of total discretionary spending and so when you look at that you know when, when the majority of our money is getting taken up by paying interest on the debt it reduces what we can put into our defense spending and and as you see there as that increases defense spending decreases which um you know in reality does become a problem for the country so this stuff does affect you know, not only what the Fed is doing, but, uh, you know, our everyday lives, it could, which is, you know, something to really think about. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about this a lot. I mean, it, it certainly, it certainly seems like we're headed the wrong direction when it comes to war talk. I mean, we're just pushing all the wrong buttons. Uh, you know, you've got major geopolitical risks right now. You got ships, you know, hitting bridges. You've got you know, lots of uh, pirates attacking cargo ships and shipping lanes. I mean, none of that stuff's, it's not dead. It's not gone. It's still happening. So I read a book, uh, the, uh, the End of the World is Just the Beginning, I think is what it was called. It's all about geopolitics, but it's, it basically called out, and this was several years ago, but it called out how we're not going to be a global economy going into the future. And if you look at China and India and the BRICS and, and all of that, I mean, you can see the story being formed right now. We're not going to be a global economy. I mean, the good news is the U.S. is in a good place from a resource standpoint, if we ever get our head out of our ass, or I should say, if the leaders of this country, the dude ever gets his head out of the, his ass about resources. Instead, we just, uh, when oil goes up too high, what we do is we sell our strategic reserves, I covered this last week, and then all of a sudden we don't replace the strategic reserves because we're trying to buy oil low, but oil's going higher. So, we're left with this very fragile, you know, emergency stash of oil, which is still contrary to what some believe what this country is run on. And, uh, you know, until we kind of understand that the resources this country has is really the backbone of this country, not the printing press, then I think we're going to we're going to continue with this problem. So, Jim, I love your comments. I agree with you on the, the chart that Stephen put up. Uh, the guy running the Ponzi scheme, that is the United States government. So that would be a uh, dude running the Ponzi scheme, but is it really the dude running the Ponzi scheme? I think that's a question to really ask. Who runs this country? Do you really think it's that frail man that can't walk upstairs or figure out which way is exiting, you know, for the stage? Or do you think there's somebody else in charge? I got to believe there's somebody else in charge. I'm sorry, but there's no way the dude is running this country. Well, his, his, him and his band of merry marching men and women I suppose are, but uh, I don't think he's making the calls. That's my that's my two cents. Yeah, I mean, if I mean, a great example is just just something as simple as Social Security. You know, Social Security is something we pay into 
our entire lives. It's designed to allow you to, you know, retire and receive retirement income, you know, at the, at the end there. And, you know, social security, the, the, the deficit of social security, when you look at projections going out over the next 20, 30 years is, is, uh, it's wild. And then when you look back and, and, you know, people have done these studies, I don't have it in front of me right now, but when you look at, it, if you were to take every dollar you ever put into social security and just invest that into index funds, you'd be pretty wealthy at the end, as opposed to that social security fund going the opposite direction. And a lot of it is due to bureaucracy and, and, and just government, you know, government has is so inefficient in everything it does. It's while I'll never understand people that want more government, bigger government, government to do more in our daily lives. I mean, when has that ever worked out greatly over the long term? Never. Never. Just a real quick sh uh, shout out to Brandon here in the office. He uh, brought me a nice Starbucks. So just throwing, throwing the shout out where it belongs. Uh, appreciate that. Needs it. Uh, yeah. So Jim Collins saying 100%. He's not in charge. I love, you know, this is bizarre. Like I got to like come over here to TikTok. Now, TikTok has always been my my platform with the most amount of haters, but something is happening. Stephen, the the winds are changing because check this out. I got a couple coming in. It says Obama's running it. We got some shout outs to Trump 2024. The elites are running the show like George Carlin said. I And, and I, I can't believe we haven't covered that George Carlin thing, but that's, that's a, a good one. George Soros runs it. That's an interesting take. You know, I, I don't know who's running it. I, I would say me being a God-fearing man, Satan is behind the wheel there. I, you guys can call me silly for thinking that, but I can't find any other way to rationalize in my mind the shit that's going on in Washington in, in this country. Because, like, it's being gutted from the inside you know, out. And uh, I, I don't know what else to say. I really don't. There's no other way to say it. So what do you think, Stephen? Uh, should we talk about, uh, should we go politics? Should we talk Trump? Because Trump media sues <laughs> co-founders, accusing them of severe mismanagement when uh, Truth Social had a major loss, which dropped their stock after their stock rallied. Uh, most most of you, I think, know by now, like if you buy an IPO, just, just kind of be aware your stock's probably going to go down. You know, it, it, it's going to go up and then it's going to go down. That's usually what an IPO does. If you're in it for the long haul, great. But if you're not in it for the long haul, just know there's going to be a little bit of shock and awe in the beginning with with that. And that's what you're having with with True Social. I don't get the whole suit, you know, but I don't know, Stephen, you got anything to say about uh, Donald Trump and him suing the co-founders of uh, True Social? I don't. I have not followed the story at all. I, you know, I, I, I love that they changed the ticker symbol when they went public to DJT, though. That's pretty classic. <laughs> Trump media technology group. So for Donald J. Trump. And so I think that's pretty great. But uh, outside of that, I have not been following that story. I'll have to catch up on it. Uh, you know, I, I got to ask, I just got to ask, did anyone buy the Trump sneakers? Did, I mean, does anyone have those on order? Because I need to see. I went, like, uh, they sold out like that. I wasn't, I wasn't quick I enough. I'm just wondering if anybody got in on those. I mean, just asking. Yeah, just asking. All right, so here's another thing too. Let's let's change gears and let's talk about EVs. Okay, just I know we cover this every week, and I just want to hit it really quick. So electric vehicles, Tesla is not having a good quarter. I'm just saying they, they're 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 stumbling or tumbling, as the the actual thing says. So Tesla tumbles toward make or break level in its latest wipeout. Stephen, I don't know if you have the Yahoo Finance with the chart of Tesla, but this is a pretty alarming chart. Do you want to go to Yahoo Finance? It's it's top headline, right up top. Yeah, uh, Tesla tumbles. Now, I love Elon Musk, and Stephen loves Elon Musk, and Lazy Cash is a huge Elon Musk fan. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I got I to ask, like, what is going on with Tesla? And, and I don't think there's a, a problem with Tesla. I just think there's a problem with this EV initiative. Did you find it there? Oops. Yeah, there we go. So I just want to see the chart. If we can get to the chart there, it's really small, huh? Oh, uh, where's the chart? Well, I don't know. When I look at it, it was the first headline thing. Let's see. Maybe I can. No, I can't pull it up because I'm running two different computers here. I guess the chart doesn't come up, but you could just pull up Tesla's stock chart. 
But anyway, what I'm trying to say while he's trying to find the, the stock chart, because I gave him bad information, the chart's there, but when you click on it, it doesn't pull the chart. So we might just have to go to Yahoo Finance and just pull up the ticker. Uh, but uh, Tesla's been having some trouble. They're, they had tons of orders, you know, and, and they delivered a lot of cars. But then all of a sudden, they, they've had a little bit of trouble recently. Their orders are down. Uh, they're just... They're just going through the same thing that GM and Ford and all the other EVs are going through. And that is just lack of demand. I mean, the the buzz, the the all out buzz about Tesla's, you know, was they're just amazing. I got to have one. And then when people got one, they're like, wait a second. I don't know if I love this, you know. And then when winter hit here in Buffalo, a lot of people couldn't get in their car because their door handles froze. Because if you if you know a Tesla, it's pretty sick. You, you kind of just the handle just pulls out. We'll try that in Buffalo after one of our snowstorms or, or freezing rainstorms. The little handle doesn't come out anymore, so you're not getting in your car. And then when you get in your car, if, if it wasn't being charged, the thing sometimes didn't start. Anyway, it's just it's a battery, right? So interestingly enough, when I was traveling back from New Zealand, I had an all-day layover in Dallas, Texas. And Dallas is where our, our private money club, uh, our developers are. So I spent the day with them. And Aiknot, who's the owner, one of the owners of the company, he just bought a brand new Toyota Prius. So when I when I kind of pulled in and I'm pulling my thing, there's a Jeep and a Prius parked there. It's the brand new one. And I looked at it. I couldn't see the Toyota thing. And I'm like, what is that? Is that a Lotus? Like, what? Did you? So when I went inside, I asked, I said, whose car is that? And Aiknot said, oh, that's my wife's new car. I said, what is it? And then he said to me, he says, oh, it's a it's a Prius. I'm like, that is not a Prius. Like, have any of you seen the new Prius? Badass car. And you know what's the coolest thing about a Prius? It actually has a gas-powered engine in it. It has a gas-powered engine with a battery. And when the engine's running, it's charging the battery. And when the battery's running, it's just helping efficiency. And the two work together. Like, where did we go off the rails of thinking that that wasn't a really good model to continue with? I don't know, Stephen, what's your what's your take on hybrids like, like Prius? Because that was, I think, one of the best ones. And then all electric cars. Yeah, no, I mean, the hybrid, I think, does make sense. It's kind of the best of both worlds at this point um, until we get to a, a point where, you know, electric vehicles maybe are a little more reliable from a charging standpoint, a, a range standpoint. Um, I mean, I, I know they're building a lot of charging stations, you know, here in Florida and I believe across the country. And so, you know, as the infrastructure builds, maybe that goes, but, you know, then you go back to where do the batteries come from? How do we get rid of the batteries? What do all those costs look like? You know, it's all the things nobody wants to talk about when we talk about green and, and renewable energy, you know, as far as Toyota Prius goes, uh, yeah, I mean, kind of futuristic looking cars. I mean, I'm, I'm okay with them as long as they stay out of the fast lane. For some reason, it seems like everybody is going <laughs> slow as hell in the fast passing lane. It's always a Prius. So get out of the passing lane and I'm all good with you though. I haven't quite noticed that out here in New York, but uh, <laughs> out in here in New York, in New York, we you know what we got a lot of uh, in upstate New York, I should say, we have a ton of pickup trucks. So there's a lot of pickups around here and a lot of SUVs, rightfully so we get snow and people don't want to be driving tiny little garbage cans that, you know, if you get hit, you're, you're in trouble. And that would be the Prius, but you see a lot of Prius and taxis and Ubers. But anyway, moving off of the EV thing, you saw the chart Tesla not having uh, such a good quarter, uh, not really uh, looking so good from a stock chart, but you know, Hey, there's, there's still one of the magnificent seven. So if any of you know, the S and P 500 is being held up by the magnificent seven. Hey, let me just pause real quick, Stephen, because you know, when we're talking about the markets, the uncertainty, the economy and all this crap going on with the fed, you know, I got a really special training that I've put together for wealth webinar today. Stephen and I have been talking a lot about what are we going to do for the trainings? And you know what we haven't talked about a lot recently? retirement. We've barely touched on retirement. I don't particularly believe in retirement as like, well, we're going to work 30 years and then we just stop working because that just usually relates in or re basically you die. I mean, how many people die right after they retire? It's a lot. But I want to talk about retirement, but I want to talk about retirement in a sense of how you can use your 401k and change one, maybe two things and literally eliminate most of the risks when it comes to retirement. We could eliminate the risk of running out of money. We could eliminate the market risk of losing money and then having to take distributions from it. Uh, and how I did this is I found an article. 
It was, it was an old article done by a CFA and a CFP, people much smarter than Stephen and I, but so smart that all they do is just put numbers on paper and they can't actually explain it. So what I did is I took this very complicated uh, report that they did and I break it down to a fifth grade level. And I'm going to show you how you can retire with almost eliminating most of the risks. Most of the risks retirement people face, which is living too long, running out of money and market risk, inflation risk and all those, healthcare risk. So we're going to hit that today at 1 p.m. If anyone wants to join us from TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, or Facebook, just go to chrisnoggle.com. My name is right there on the screen and just register for the wealth webinar. Totally free. So we'll see you all at one. Sorry. I had to pivot on that because we never talk about that. So what else can we hit here? Uh, we, we talk just real fast before we get off the EV thing, I did see this weekend, um, there's a electric vehicle company called Fisker. Have you heard of Fisker, Chris? They're actually... Yeah. Yeah pretty cool cars, but they just came out over the weekend and, and said basically half price off of all their 2023 inventory. So just to give you an idea, I mean, you get a $54,000 Fisker right now for 36 grand. So if you are in the market, I mean, that's a pretty cool looking car for 36 grand. I mean, I don't know anything about them. I mean, 35 grand, 35, you know, so some pretty good prices. I mean, $62,000 car for 38,000. I mean, so if you are in the market, you know, maybe worth maybe worth taking a look at there. But you then got to ask, why are they half off? Anyway, story already told. So I, I got to hit some of these. Stephen, look at some of these comments coming in with this electric stuff. Uh, here, I got to hit this one. Morgan came in. He said, he said, this is wild. I found a company that is offering a diesel electric conversion for midsize trucks using a diesel generator to charge batteries. Each wheel has an electric motor generator pretty freaking cool so i yeah. am probably the biggest fan of diesel okay and why because it's efficient i used to own a bmw uh 328 diesel and that thing got like 45 miles to the gallon literally i felt like i never put diesel in that thing yes it makes that diesel sound but it had a ton of torque it was pretty fast it was smooth and I'll tell you, you know, when that whole Volkswagen thing happened with diesels, where they were talking about the emissions being reported wrong, all I'm going to tell you is diesels are incredibly efficient. So if you were to build a hybrid with a diesel engine, like a three-cylinder diesel with an electric battery or something like what Morgan said, now, now we're moving in the right direction. Uh, then also Mazda, uh, Ken said, I saw a Mazda single rotary engine as a power for a hybrid generator. If any of you remember the Mazda RX-7 that was a rotary engine, incredibly efficient with tons of power and a lot of reliability. Why they got rid of that, I don't know. But I mean, it just seems like all the things that work, we find a reason to get rid of them and find things that don't work to push to the public. It just doesn't make any bloody sense. Yes, yes, yes. All right, what I'm just looking at the rest of these comments. Can't wait for these battery powered leaf blowers to be in the landfills. Oh yeah, does anyone mow their lawn with a battery powered lawnmower? <laughs> I mean, what were you thinking if you did? I just asking for a friend. Like if you bought a battery powered lawnmower, why? Why? I gotta ask, cause like that to me is just, that's stupid. And yes, the battery powered uh, leaf blowers, I do have one of those. My mom bought it for me and the battery's already dead and the thing doesn't work. Just give me a little gas motor. Like just give me the like, bring rim. Why is it that landscapers always use gas powered leaf blowers and weed whackers? It's because they work. You don't see any of those guys with electric powered leaf blowers and electric powered, uh, you know, weed whackers. You see them with gas powered ones. Has anyone flown on an electric airplane? Would anyone want to fly in an electric airplane? I, I mean, I'm just making the case here, Stephen. Like it's it's like all this push to EV, and it's just like, does anyone want to fly in an airline that is powered by just electric motors? Because I don't. I'm just not really cool with that. But anyway, I think that's enough on EV. Where should we go from here? Have you um have you been following some of the squatters' right stuff in New York and Georgia and some of these different states oh. and what's going on with it all? Um, you know, there's been a lot of stories out lately of these, you know, landlords that, you know, well, it's landlords, people have vacation homes, um, you know, maybe they're, they're working on a property and just set up, let it vacant for a while, a second home, things like that. And, and these states have come out with these laws now that treat squatters with more rights than the land owner, which if we destroy property rights in this country, 
I don't think there's any turning back. So it's 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 kind of interesting to see this stuff actually happening now in reality. These laws have been passed. I mean, this was just an article over the weekend. Queens couple, uh, New York, buys a $2 million dream home to care for disabled son only to find a squatter living inside. And I'm not sure if this was the one where they tried to get the squatter out by changing the locks, but the police actually came and arrested the landowner, the the the, um, the owners of the house, they arrested them, saying, "Hey, you're not allowed to change the locks on this home because there's a squatter living here." Um, now, keep in mind, these squatters do not have leases; they have never paid rent, and there's story and story and story coming out right now um, of, of this happening. And then, on top of that, you had this guy that went on social media and he started, you know, basically telling people. Hey, these are the laws. This is how you can move into a house and never pay rent and squat there and legally stay there for years. And so now these guys are on social media, like showing other people how to do it. And then I was seeing these stories over the weekend of how these like mastermind criminals, because criminals are always going to be two steps ahead. They're always going to gain the system. Them, they're always going to take advantage. And so they're actually going out there and they're squatting in these properties. And then they're actually renting the, the rooms in these houses to other squatters. And the squatters are paying the main squatter money to stay in this house completely legally, according to these states, but according to reality, should be completely illegal. So it's pretty crazy to see happening. And then the opposite of that and why Florida is just overrun right now with people moving here is DeSantis came out over the last week and said, okay, we are going to do the opposite of this. We are never going to allow squatters to happen. And if that occurs in a state, like you're more than welcome to take care of them and kick it out of your property. And we're never going to stand for that. So it's wild to see something like property rights becoming political. I mean, that should be like a fundamental principle of this country. Like, who's going to argue that if you own a property, you can't control that property? Like, I, I don't get who's on the other side of this fight. So, pretty crazy to see. But well, let's just, that. Stephen, let's just start with the state that you mentioned, which is the state where I live, and I, and I think this is a terrible, terrible, terrible state to live. In. However, it is beautiful, and unfortunately for me, it's where my mother is, and I can't take my daughter from my mom. It's just, it's just not part of it. So can I talk a little bit about squatters? During the pandemic, right before the pandemic kicked in, I had bought a property in Buffalo. I bought it from foreclosure. It was a really good buy. We got it for a great price. It was kind of in a, a questionable area, but it was still a great deal. So we bought the property. In New York, it takes forever to close because we're an attorney state. So it took like a month and a half to close on this foreclosure. During that month and a half, a squatter had moved into the house. Unbeknownst to me, I didn't know. Because in a foreclosure, you can't really get into the house. You're just sort of guessing when you buy them uh, the way that we used to buy houses. And, you know, we didn't know somebody was living there. So lo and behold, when we closed on the property, very shortly after we closed, literally a week after COVID shut the country down, when Stephen and I were in uh, Disney, doing a, a live presentation to nobody because the president shut the, the country down because of COVID. So a squatter moved into our house, right? And I couldn't evict the squatter. All the courts were shut down. The police would give us, because we called the police all the time. I sent Darcy, who was our property uh, manager. She worked for us. I sent her over there just to see what's going on. And the lady came out with a baseball bat and chase Darcy off. So Darcy wouldn't go back. So we called the police and the police could do absolutely nothing. The police said, there's nothing we can do. She's got rights. So she is living there. You'll have to go through the court systems. I said, the court systems are closed. Well, you're going to have to wait for them to open. Does anyone know how long it took for the courts to open here in New York? Over a year. So this person lived in my house for over a year. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details because for obvious reasons, and even though this isn't recorded and saved, it is live. But let's just say that I got a call from the neighbor who I got to be friends with. And I told the neighbor said, hey, you know, your squatter is out on a drug run. Just letting you know. So I sent my crews over there to board up all the windows, all the doors. And we boarded every window and every door in the first and the second floor. The only window that was available and open was the attic window. Has anyone ever seen like a, a two story house and there's that little attic way up there? The neighbor calls me back when this woman has, had come back from her drug run and said, you're never going to believe this. She is literally scaling the back of your house trying to get in the attic window. Now, she did not succeed. So that's how we got rid of the squatter. But I just want you to know, like, I went through a squatter situation. 
Right after that is when we sold all of our rentals. We had 91 rentals and we sold almost every one of them. But you got to ask why are the rights so in favor of squatters, so in favor of the, the renters? Think about it. New York's a very liberal state. Although Trump, did you just see he won New York last night? Just, just saying, I didn't see that coming. Trump won New York last night. I, I couldn't believe my ears and I thought my wife was lying to me. But indeed he did. So anyway, New York's very liberal and so is California. So therefore, if you were really looking at the dude's plan and the Fed's plan, where is the middle class's wealth? Like where does the where is most of the middle class's wealth? Stephen, what do you think? Where where is the middle class's wealth? Yeah, like the middle class, where do you think most of their wealth is 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 in? Like what do you think the the middle class is wealth? Would, yeah, the home. I would say that. Yeah, in their home, and a lot of like mom and pops and just average working folks, they they'll buy a rental. So, what would be the best way to strip the middle class and make it just a you know a you know a two class system? What would be the best way to do that? It'd be to take property back. So, in New York, I can tell you, if you don't pay your your taxes, they'll foreclose on your property. They'll take your property. If you have a squatter living in your house, it's going to be very difficult to get them out. Uh, so everything is stacked against the middle class, against the property owner in favor of eliminating the main wealth of the middle class. That's just my take, but it just makes sense. What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it makes com complete sense. I mean, you know, you got to you got to you, you have to protect property rights. It's a fundamental part of the United States of America. And unfortunately i don't think this is going to actually i don't think anything's actually going to change until someone gets killed you know someone said in the, the comments over here um where was it owners are now contacting the mafia to remove squatters and i don't know if you're joking or not but i can see that being true or just somebody just you know they've worked their whole lives they you know decided to buy a, a rental property and you know all their money went into it their sweat and tears went into fixing it up to provide a, a rental home for another family and a squatter takes that thing over and this this guy over here that worked his whole life to buy that property feels like he has no rights to get these people out that have just stolen his property essentially i mean how long is that going to take before he just takes a gun and goes in and kills the whole people living there i mean all I, I fun and games that, until someone gets their eye poked out you know that's what my mom used to tell me and that's reality. And I, I think something like that will cause the change. But why do we have to wait for, for a devastating event like that to occur before we realize the insanity of this? And so, Well, someone on TikTok, uh, Mocha said, everything is so backwards. Would anyone else agree with Mocha? Like everything is just backwards. And Marcus came in. In California, there's now a post-auction vacancy, vacancy service. And Jim Collins said, suggestion, have your attorney draw up an affidavit that is signed by the seller at closing that confirms no squatters are inhabiting the property and include liquidated damages if squatters are there. That That's great if you're buying from a private seller, but we were buying from the city. We were buying foreclosures that were foreclosed because of taxes and other reasons. So you're not going to sit there and tell the city of Buffalo, hey, I want you know an affidavit. They're going to just say piss off. We're going to sell it to the next person. That's just the thing. I mean, yeah. we used to go to the uh, the auctions, you know, which is we called it the Elko. There's a little table, and I got to be pretty well known there because we bought a lot of properties there. And you just sit there and you're just bidding on it. You have no rights. You're just going to take the property for what it is. You you can't have your attorney do anything otherwise. They'll just say piss off. Yeah. Or what if you've already owned the property and you just it's vacant for a few months because you're out of town or or whatever the case might be. And somebody, you know, somebody takes it over that way. Lots of problems. Yeah. Lynn said, New York has guys in red jackets who help people. Maybe they could help. Who are the guys in red jackets? Anyone know? Guy, Lynn, who are the guys in red jackets? Yeah. In, in another TikTok comment as we're waiting says, a homeless ex or a homestead exemption is all it should take. Yeah. Girls are getting punched in the face. Uh, in the streets of New York City. You know, an interesting thing, you know, we always every year, my daughter's three and a half, we take my daughter to the Plaza Hotel. She loves Eloise. And we would stay in the Eloise suite. That's what we would do. And we would use that trip as our trip to, to do all of our charitable giving for the year. We would plan it all out. And every time we'd go there, 
we would make a donation to Howard Stern's wife for her cat shelters. But anyway, we're, we had to cancel our trip to New York City this year. So we're not going to the Plaza Hotel for her birthday, which is, is very sad to me. But we're not going because we had friends just there and they said, Chris and, and Larissa, it is not safe. Do not bring do not bring Vivi here. And if you do bring Vivi here, do not leave your hotel. So like when you go to New York City, do you want to just sit in a hotel? Even I know the Plaza Hotel is pretty badass, but I don't want to just sit in the Plaza Hotel. I want to go to the, you know, I want to travel. I want to walk around like we did last time. It's just not safe right now. And that's a sad thing. But hey, you know what? Neither is California. Anyone been to LA recently? I refuse to go. So if anyone had a great speaking event for me in LA, I will not travel to LA. I will not go. San Diego is better, but still get, you know, not great. I mean, like, look at look at what's going on. Chicago, New York, California. I mean, what's the common denominator? We all know, you know, the common denominator is they're very liberal. And because of that, these cities, San Francisco to be included, are literally just being devastated right now. Uh, and then I don't know, I've been to I've been to Florida a whole bunch speaking. I, I just got back from Texas. I mean, those cities, like I don't feel I don't feel in danger at all walking around in Florida. I don't feel in, and I'm sure there's certain parts of Florida that are bad, but I don't feel in danger at all walking around in Texas. We were, matter of fact, walking around downtown Dallas and I was like, this is clean. So what's the difference, Stephen? Yeah, you know, you don't even need to answer that. Oh, but, the dude, the dude. And then, and then you see, you know, we were at a mastermind last week in Tampa, and I think the most, um, I don't know, the most mind opening moment I had at this mastermind was really looking at AI and how AI is is being used right now in business and marketing and in sales and how and the capabilities that AI truly has right now as we sit here in April of 2024 and how quickly it's ramping up. And so when I see things, you know, on April 1st out in California, they just changed a new law where fast food workers um, now have a minimum wage of $20 an hour. So it's a 25% increase. Um, and and you, you kind of read into it a little bit more. It's, it's great for the workers. Okay, I mean, California is a expensive state. You know, do I think it should be forced upon by the state? No, but paying people, you know, to be able to live, I understand. But you don't take into account what else does that affect? And you already see a lot of these companies that were affected and have to now pay, you know, their minimum wage employees twenty dollars an hour. You know, there there's already starting to be pushback on that. So when we take things like a twenty dollar minimum wage and and you couple that with, you know, people like uh, Steve Cohen here, um, who's a billionaire, he owns the Mets. You know, he's talking about how a four-day work week is coming, um, you know, in part because of AI and how AI can start replacing people. Well, what better way to incentivize a company to replace people than forcing them to pay an unsustainable wage to their employees? And so when we start looking at this, Chris, you know, the last few minutes here, I mean, what are your thoughts on some of this stuff when it comes to AI and it comes to paying, you know, minimum wage? I mean, you know, minimum wage when I was a kid, minimum wage was for a high school student, somebody, you know, maybe college, somebody just trying to make some extra money to get by. You know, I don't think minimum wage was, you know, those entry level positions were ever meant or designed to sustain a family or, or an actual life. I mean, how many you know young people do you know that have roommates because it's required to pay? I mean, when I was a kid, I didn't have a big house to myself. I was making minimum wage and I had multiple roommates to be able to survive. So, you know, at what point do we say, listen, like you need to move on, you need to get an education, you need to learn a skill and earn your way to making more money instead of just being forced upon by the state or the government saying this stuff. And, you know, I think it's a really great conversation, but it does lead into now that employees can be replaced, you know, how quickly some of this stuff can ramp up. Yeah. There's a lot of comments coming in on the minimum wage thing. I don't really have too much to say about that. I mean, I think people's wages should be, you know, increased, not because someone says it is, but by their, their level of service, their, 
their problems that they solve. Now I know that's hard because you could work super hard for the wrong company or the wrong employer and they'll never raise your, but again, it's, it, it, that's a tough one to go into, but I did want to come over here. Uh, cause I, this is interesting. Anthony from TikTok said, have you seen the crime rate in red States? You guys lost all objectivity. Um, I haven't really paid attention to crime rates. Have you Steven in red States? I, I haven't Are seen saying that red States have bad crime rates. Have you looked at the major cities in this know. country? Have you looked at Baltimore and Chicago and New York city and Los Angeles and San Francisco and, and, and St. Louis. And do you want me to keep going? I mean, the crime is unbelievably re high in these States right now. Now, if you're following mainstream media, they're using all these statistics. Um, if you look at actually the FBI reported data, uh, these cities are not required to report data. So they're excluding these, these big, huge uh, Democrat led, led cities. That crime is just unbelievable. And it, it, just go there, just talk to the people there. I mean, like you just talked about New York city. I mean, either believe what you're being fed by the mainstream media or believe your own eyes. I mean, that choice is yours. If you want to go through life, just being a, a sheep and, and, and being completely ignorant to reality, go for it. But no, that is completely false. If that's what they're claiming. Okay. Yeah. I don't know bring, what they're claiming. Anthony, if you want for that, I'm happy. Happy to bring receipts for that. That's easy to show. Anthony, if you want to comment and tell us uh, what do the crime rates look like in the red states? Because clearly, like, we're not sitting here just on one side. We, we're we not seeing the crime rates in the red states like we are in the blue states. Uh, I live in New York. I will tell you what it's like. I live in upstate New York, so I'm a little bit padded. But I can certainly tell you what New York City is looking like because I've got friends there. I can tell you what Chicago, you know, is looking like because I've been there. You know, in L.A., I don't think I need to even tell you what's going on in LA and San Francisco. So I don't know. I mean, I guess it's all relative, but here's an interesting thing. Somebody just did a comment that I have to hit on. Oh, Ed or Edie, uh, not Ed, Edie uh, said, businesses are moving to kiosks and self checkouts. This eliminates jobs for the low skill. So then I come over here to CNBC, Amazon ditches cashless or cashierless checkout system at its grocery stores. How many of you have been to a grocery store that has gone all uh, self-checkout? I, I mean, I can't. I have. We have one right down the I road. Mean, really? How about you, yeah. Stephen? I, I have. I don't, I don't see any of those, but I would refuse to go to one if, if it was. Yeah. So, I like a cashier. So we have, me too. I like that human relationship. Um, but I did go to one. And all I can tell you it was an awful, awful experiment. Um, I, I, I was paying for, I can't remember what it was, something simple. And I put change in the machine. I actually had change and I put it in the machine and the machine wouldn't accept the change and it wouldn't give me it back. So it was a mess. Then I had to call a human being over to fix the problem. Uh, they couldn't figure it out. They had to bring a manager over. Finally, I just said, listen, I don't have time for this. I'm, keep the change. It's no big deal. And I just walked out. But it, it's just when we replace humans with computers, like what they're saying here with this cashierless checkout systems, we are going to have problems. It is not a refined system. And you just, you just to, in my opinion, you can't replace a human being. You can't replace a human relationship with a computer. I don't care what AI says, because they say that you can, and I say you can't. And that's, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, another thing too, I want to mention, we talked earlier about the Fed, but now I found the article. So Atlanta Fed President Bostic sees only one rate cut this year occurring, occurring in the fourth quarter. And then Steve Cohen says that the Fed may have a hard time getting inflation down to its goal. So do you see, like, right, I almost feel like they must be listening, but that's painting the picture of what this year is going to shape up like. Because if you've got the Atlanta Fed president saying that they only see one rate cut, why is he saying that? Anyway. What else do we got here? I know we're at time, but I just want to hit just one or two other questions or comments here. In Georgia, it takes, let's see, $20 minimum wage will squeeze the middle class since the cost of business will increase. And Yeah. I mean, listen, it's good and great that they're raising minimum wage, you know, for these jobs. But what does that mean? It means we're all going to pay more. So there's always a, a give take. There's a trade off. If, if minimum wage goes up. They make more money and, and they're still not going to want to work a $20 minimum because if $20 minimum wage is, is $20, what happens to all the other wages that are like 25 for a much more skilled job? They have to go up. 
So it's it's a chain, it's a domino effect. One increase like that is going to increase everything else, which is going to drive the cost of everything up, playing right back into the opposite of what the Fed wants, which is decreasing inflation. When wages go up, price of goods go up, which is inflation. I mean, just I don't know. You just got to play one with the other and understand what's happening here. And uh, let's see, last one, TA said, of course, the crime rate is higher in red states because we still prosecute for crimes like theft. And oh my gosh, nailed it. Where is it? Anthony, you, I don't think you could rebuttal that one. So why is it that, that crime rates are higher in red states? Because the law enforcement is actually doing their effing job. Oh, by the way, I don't know this to be fact, but I don't think I can swear anymore on here, Stephen. I was told that social media sites like Instagram, TikTok, if you swear in a comment, they will block your account for 30 days. So I'm trying not to swear, but like, Anthony, if you're still with us on TikTok, please answer or tell me like how TA is not right, because that is the most logical answer I've ever heard. And TA, just to repeat, it said, of course, the crime rate is higher in red states because we still prosecute for crimes like theft and drugs. It's plummeting where you legalize theft and drugs. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do I need to tell everybody? Like there are, there are people, criminals on the street that are literally not being arrested for stealing, for breaking into a store. I mean, we, we've seen this since the, the pandemic in Portland. We've seen this in Chicago. We've seen this in, in California. We've seen this in New York. You try doing that shit. Whoops. See if I get banned. You try doing that stuff in Texas and Florida, <laughs> you'll get shot. They have guns. They actually still have guns and can buy bullets and can have like, you know, the fun stuff. We can't have that stuff here in New York legally, but you'll probably get shot. So go ahead and try to steal and, you know, do things like that. I, I don't know. I don't know. That's all I have to say about that, Stephen. Anything you want to say as closing? Because I think T.A. really knocked it out of the park there. No, you're good. You're good. I got so many examples of that stuff, but we'll, uh, we'll let it go for today. It was good. We didn't have a chance chance to get into any of the kind of wars going on right now around the world or the uh the immigration crisis illegal immigration crisis we're facing and what's going on with all that but maybe we'll get to it next week we'll see oh i do want to mention uh my wife told me last night because she reads the news every single night and she briefs me and she said that uh there are record numbers of voters registering without driver's licenses just saying prepare yourself like I know it seems like, you know, the, the, the there's a clear winner right now, you know, from in the, the equation, but you're not playing into the fact of uh, the cheating and all that. But with that being said, folks, join us at 1 p.m. today on the Wealth Webinar. That's 1 p.m. Eastern today. Go to chrisnoggle.com and register for it. Get my books for free just for registering. And we're going to be talking about how you can mitigate the risks that retirees have by changing one, maybe two things. We'll see you then. Thanks for joining us, Stephen. It was awesome. I don't know where lazy cash went, but he always dips out when it's important.